All right, welcome back to the very last video in this particular series on the gas laws. And today is actually not a gas law. It is a whole um, comprehensive theory of how gases work. And this theory is called KMT, which is short for kinetic molecular theory or KMT. I'm probably just gonna call it KMT because kinetic molecular theory is a lot to say. <laughs> this, I like this one. This one tells why. Why do gases do what they do? Why do they um, you know, increase volume when you increase temperature? Why does increasing pressure decrease volume? And so forth and so on. So all the gas laws that we've looked at, all right, quick review. You had Boyle's Law, and we had Charles Law, and we had Avogadro's Law, which I, you know, oh, guy still can't spell that, and we had the Ideal Gas Law, and we even had Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. All of these tell you what? What do I mean? Well, just take the big one, PV is equal to NRT. This tells you what. If I increase, if um, you know, I have this pressure and this volume and this moles, then it's gonna be this temperature. This tells you what. It doesn't tell you why this works. Now there are uh, mathematical proofs for some of these things and theorems and that kind of thing, but it's still basically telling you what happens. When Mr. Boyle, way back when, did his study on pressure and volume, he looked at what. When I increase pressure, what happens? KMT, is nice because this is going to tell you why. And we're going to go all the way down to the particle level because, you know, this is chemistry class, all right? And we're going to learn to think of a gas not as a whole, not as the air you're, you're experiencing in your room, wherever you're at right now. Um, and not as the steam you might see coming up from a pot of boiling water. That's kind of the whole picture. Like there's millions of molecules in there, but thinking about these little tiny particles. And so by the time we're done this, I hope that you will think of a gas in terms of the little tiny particles that are inside that gas, instead of just thinking it's kind of this nebulous idea that uh, maybe you don't really understand, but it just sort of is. That's kinetic molecular theory. Um, it does make a couple of assumptions. Kinetic molecular theory assumes an ideal gas. What's an ideal gas? An ideal gas is one that follows these laws. It follows the ideal gas law. You say, wait a minute, miss. You've been telling me all these laws. Or you mean to tell me there's some gases that do not follow those laws? Okay, listen, they're pretty close, okay? I wasn't really, you know, I'm not lying to you, like, they're, they're pretty close, but sometimes they're a little off. We're just going to assume our gases are perfect and they perfectly follow all of these laws. That's an ideal gas. And um, it, it does make a couple of a simplifying assumptions, but here's the deal. At normal temperature, like planet Earth temperatures, um, these assumptions are going to be totally fine. They may not be 100% accuracy, accurate, but most of the time they'll be okay. I'm not very good at drawing. Oh dear. This is supposed to be a globe. Sure, that's what it looks like, right? No, it doesn't look, that's, yeah, okay. Whatever, there's a globe. Um, yay. And so while you're here on planet Earth, regular temperature, so let's say anywhere from like zero to 100 degrees Celsius, regular pressure of roughly one atmosphere, you're good to go. Uh, it's okay to make these assumptions. As you get to really cold temperatures, really hot temperatures, really high pressures, or sometimes really low pressures, they may start to vary from some of these numbers. So in other words, if you calculated the pressure at a super, super, super high temperature, and then you went and did an experiment, it may not match up exactly, but that's okay. We're mostly gonna stick to earth kind of conditions. All right, let's get into this theory. This theory has a total of five postulates. And yep, you're gonna have to know these postulates, all right? 
The first one is the easiest one. Dun -da -dun, KMT postulate number one. Gases consist of tiny particles, either atoms or molecules. Well, good gravy, my dear students. Um, if you got this far in chemistry and didn't know this, I guess I have failed as a teacher. Yeah, so if you're looking at like a balloon, and this is kind of the difference between, there's a balloon. It looks just like a balloon, right? It's even perfectly round. This is the difference between sometimes like a chemist and, and, and someone who hasn't taken chemistry or doesn't think this way. People just see a balloon, well, it's just a balloon, like it exists, it's got air in it. And to a chemist, you sort of see it with those little tiny particles in there, that it's not one whole thing. It's a bunch of little things put together. That's how I want you to think about gases. They're teeny tiny particles, they're spread out very far, um, but it's made of little particles. So if you really want to understand the gas as a whole, you got to understand the little particles. All right, that's postulate number one. I may not necessarily give you time to write down all of this. This is a video, so if you need more time to write this down in your notes, then definitely feel free to pause, okay? All right, postulate number two. Ah, this one's bigger. But the idea, we've actually had this idea before. It says the particles are so small compared to the distance between them that the volume or size of the individual particles can be assumed to be zero um, or negligible. Negligible means it doesn't matter. What am I talking about? Sometimes I'll use this example. Let's imagine um, this entire lab that I'm teaching in right now, like a big room or maybe your bedroom, okay? So, or your house. So this is a bedroom, there's the bed. Yeah, that's a bed, okay? Here's a bedroom. And let's say that in this room, we place um, down there in the center, you place a little tiny golf ball. That's a golf ball. Okay, I'm not, not to scale, but whatever. Imagine one little golf ball in a big room. Okay, got that in your head? Now, imagine the same room, but this time, instead of a golf ball, we put a little tennis ball, just one. One golf ball in the room, one tennis ball in the room. So you can, yeah. Um, does, that, does that really matter? Like compared to the size of the room, think about the size of those balls. They are different sizes, right? Little golf ball versus tennis ball. Like there's a size difference. Does that matter compared to how big this room is? Like is the room feel any more full because you put a tennis ball in there versus a golf ball. No, it doesn't. It's like the ball is so small, it doesn't really matter. Like, yeah, they're different sizes, but it doesn't matter. That's even more extreme for a gas particle. Gas particles are so tiny. And in a gas, they are so spread out. The drawings that we make, like this drawing, that's not to scale, folks. That's These are way too big. Um, at this scale, the particles are so small, you could not see them on this paper. And, and, and that's, that's true for most things. We, we never draw them to scale because it's like, oh, hey, you know, here's my big balloon. And ready, 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 we're gonna put a gas particle in there. Don't you see them? Oh, you don't see them? Yeah, that's the kind of scale you're talking about. You wouldn't even see them. That's how tiny they would be compared to the volume, okay? So gas particles are so small that the distance between them, uh, compared to the distance between them that we assume the size does not matter, the size is zero. This is why, guys, if you fill this balloon with, let's say, I don't know, one mole, I know you hate moles, too bad, one mole of hydrogen, and you fill another identical balloon with one mole of helium, it does not matter which gas is in that balloon as far as filling the balloon goes. They're gonna be the same volume, the same size, at the same temperature and pressure. So it really just matters how much you have. Doesn't matter what gas you have as far as numbers and volume and pressure goes. It just matters how much. All right, postulate number three. This one I like. Particles are in constant random motion as they collide with the walls of their container and the force of these tiny collisions causes pressure. Um, you start singing that song, you know, pressure like a drip, 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 
Okay, never mind. So, standing is something under pressure. Um, maybe you've got a scuba tank. Here's your big, I don't really, there's a dial on it, right? Or something and whatever. This is your big scuba tank. Um, and that you know that that is under pressure. There's a lot of gases in there. So you have these tiny gas particles in your tank. And I think I've kind of talked about this before. They're moving. As they move, this particle, it was just this particle, it's going to keep going until it hits into something. And then it will bounce off until it hits into something. And then it will bounce off until it hits into something and bounce off. And then maybe it bounces here and then here and then here. You know, see, it's kind of a random motion. It's going to keep bouncing off. Um, and I, I, I'm not doing this right, but whatever. It's just going to keep bouncing around until it gives you a headache. That is the idea of gases. Now imagine that's just one little particle bouncing around. Imagine now you have millions of particles bouncing around. I included in Schoology a link to a little program that actually shows this. It shows like a square and it shows all these tiny particles moving. I think it's super helpful to show and to mess around with. You can play with the controls and add more particles, less particles, speed them up. You can see the temperature, the pressure, whatever. And it's really helpful just to visualize what are these gases doing? What would it look like if I could see them? You know, we can't see them, right? It's all just a theory, but we think we're right. Um, but what would it look like if you could see them? And I think that's going to help you visualize. It's called falstad.com, F-A-L-S-T-A-D.com, uh, I think backslash gas or something like that. I'll put a link to that in Schoology. Uh, but go look it up and have some fun with it, play around with it, and look at all these collisions happening. But that's the basis of pressure. Every single time you have a container, every single time a gas hits into that container, that is causing pressure. All right? It's the sum of a bunch of tiny movements. And, I mean, I, I don't know if you like birthday balloons or if you ever made a balloon animal. So if you make like a, the little classic like little like balloon dog, you know, you ever had one of those at like a fair or something? Um, I actually can make these little balloon dogs like that. You know what I'm talking about? It's a balloon. How is a balloon held open? A balloon is held open by this. Inside of there, all the little teeny tiny gas particles are pushing against the walls of that container and that causes a pressure and that keeps that balloon open. So that's the idea. Okay, postulate number four. Oh, nice and short one. Particles are assumed, that's the ideal. If it's ideal, we're assuming it's gonna do this. Not to attract or repel each other. What? Okay, you want to think of them as like little hard spheres. So let's say that these are my gas particles, okay? And they're like little solid spheres. I know they're flat, they'd be round, you know, a, a spherical, but these are just little circles, but whatever. And these are my little two particles. Let's say they're moving through the air and bam, they whack into each other. When they whack into each other, they're gonna bounce off. And that's just physics. If you've taken physics and looked at the laws of momentum and A and B and they collide, is it elastic or inelastic, what happens? That's what happens here, it's due to momentum and force and blah, blah, blah. But they're gonna hit and bounce off. They do not, it's not like um, like Play-Doh. Like Play-Doh, if Play-Doh hits into itself, it kind of can like smush, right? These don't smush. They're like hard objects is the idea. And they'll hit and they'll bounce off. And then maybe it bounces off this guy and hits this guy and then maybe whatever. And you can kind of imagine gases binging and bonging off of each other. That's postulate number four, pretty simple idea. Um, why is this important? Now, this will be kind of weird, guys. But what if the gas actually did attract each other? So, like, what if these two particles hit into each other? Ding. And instead of bouncing off, they actually stuck together. That would be attract. So, it's like a positive and negative, right? Like, opposites attract. So, what if they, like, stuck to each other? That's not good. You know why that's not good? That's air. What if air did that? It would be like, you go in a room and, you know, you'd be breathing air. And all of a sudden, oh, they start clumping up and clumping up and... And pretty soon there'd be like no air in this corner of the room. It'd all be over here. And if you happen to be standing over there, oh no, um, bad news for you, right? You wouldn't have any air. 
it doesn't do that. It just evenly fills out. It doesn't attract and it doesn't repel. So if it repelled, if these are like coming in and going to hit, they go, ah, and they might, you know, veer off or veer and they wouldn't actually want to collide. They just act like hard plastic balls. They're not attracted um, or repelled from each other. They just hit into each other and move on with their life. So simple idea, but important applications for how gases behave. All right, postulate number five. This one we actually have already had as well. It says the average kinetic energy of the gas particles is directly proportional. Remember, that means if one goes up, the other one goes up. If one goes down, the other one goes down. Directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature of that gas. This is basically defining temperature. Okay, it's defining temperature. So if you want to draw a little thermometer, that's not a very good thermometer, and whatever, maybe it looks like a thermometer, okay? Draw a little thermometer, that's kind of the idea here. Temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy. So if you have a gas particle, here's this little gas particle, and this little gas particle is moving very slowly. It's just like, it's not moving very fast, poor little guy, okay? Versus you have this other gas particle, and this is moving very fast. So it's going like a comet, Whew! okay? Slow, fast. Those particles will have a different temperature. Assuming it was like a whole bunch of particles. One particle, that's pretty hard to measure temperature for. So as it goes slow, it has low kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is energy of motion, right? Remember that? So if it's going slowly, not very much kinetic energy, which means low temperature. That's what it is to be cold. Cold means the particles are like just moving slowly. As it warms up, as you increase kinetic energy, you will also increase temperature. So if it starts moving quickly, that means it's got a higher temperature, right? And that's going to have some application as well. So basically, if you understand the definition of temperature, you should be pretty good to go. The only note I want to make here is it is an average, average kinetic energy. Um, you can put it on a graph this way. So it's like, let's say that this, uh, this side is number of particles, like how many particles. And then this side, you can either say speed or energy. Um, I guess we'll just say speed, like how fast they're moving. Um, let's say that this is my temperature. This is the average kinetic energy. I'll put Ke here. The average, let's say maybe this is, I don't know, 20 degrees Celsius. Okay, that would be my average. That would have the most number of particles moving that fast. But you would have some particles moving a little bit slower and some moving a little quicker. And it, it usually makes a bell curve like this, if you're used to that in math class. And so those would kind of come off the sides like that. Um, most of your particles are right here at the average, right there in the middle. That is the temperature, the average Ke, kinetic energy basically related to speed of the particle. Uh, but there will be some that are going faster, there will be some that are going slower. The reason for that is as you have a whole bunch of particles together and they're all kind of moving around and hitting into each other, um, if you know physics very well, so like let's say this guy's moving really fast, whee, and this guy's moving slower, boom. Now the fast one hit the slow one, that the slow one might pick up energy and go off real fast, and the blue one might start moving slow. So, you know, they hit and then they kind of reverse. Um, or like this one might be coming in fast and then it goes off a little bit slower. Uh, the blue one might even like almost stop entirely for a second until maybe something else hits into it or whatever. So um, they're not all moving the same speed because of all these random collisions. Some of them at any given time are moving faster than others, but there's an average and that average stays roughly the same unless you add heat or take away heat, okay? You don't need to be able to draw that or anything, but that's the idea of temperature. Okay, those are your five KMT postulates. How would you use this? I'm just gonna show you one quick example. I'll give you some more on your worksheet to do yourself. These postulates can explain the gas laws. You remember this? You have all these gas laws. They tell what? 
KMT tells why. So you can pick any one of them. Let's pick Charles's Law. Charlie Brown's a TV show, so temperature and volume. Charles Law says what? It says what happens. It says if you increase temperature, then you will also increase volume if pressure stays the same. Now you can answer the question why, and <clears throat> that will make a truly excellent essay question, right? Why is Charles's Law true? So think about that for a second. Charles's Law says... Um, uh, T1 V1 is equal to T2 V2 is his law. So if temperature increases, therefore or then volume will increase if pressure is the same. And a good example for Charles's law is always a balloon. So if you have a balloon like that, um, we're not going to change the number of particles. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There's 10 little gas particles in there for just sake of argument. But let's say that you heat this up. So you're going to increase temperature. What happens to these gas particles if you increase temperature? What does that mean? That's postulate number five. Temperature is average kinetic energy. Okay, so the application, if I increase the temperature, if T goes up, so we'll draw... A little fire underneath of it. I, you shouldn't put a fire under a balloon for reasons. Um, it will explode eventually, but you know, whatever. So we're heating this up, right? These little particles, they start moving faster. That's what temperature is. Higher temperature, the particles move faster. What does that have to do with volume? So this balloon would get bigger. The volume would increase. We'd still only have the 10 little particles. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. But it's now bigger. There's more space in there. Why does that make sense? Because it should. Well, if the particles are moving faster, then they're going to hit into the walls of their container uh, more often. Okay? Okay. They move faster, so they're going to hit into the walls more often, and that's one part of it. And the other part of it is when they finally hit into the walls of their container, like, bam, um, they're going to have more energy because they have a higher kinetic energy, a higher speed. So they're going to hit more often as they're binging and bonging around, and they're going to hit with more energy. And so it just pushes the walls of the container back, in this case, the balloon. It pushes it open more. It's a literal force, okay? because we have more collisions and we have them more often. That is why. So we looked at Charles's law saying what, and then if you think about the particles and what they're doing and what does temperature mean and what does volume mean, you should be able to explain why using kinetic molecular theory. So your job is to try one or two of the other ones. Try Avogadro's law, try Boyle's law. Can you explain that? Um, why would Boyle's Law be true? Can you explain that using KMT? Okay, hope you enjoyed, and have a good one. See you later.